Uh, Secretary Cohen, before we talk about Ukraine, I want to ask you uh, your thoughts on Madeleine Albright, your former uh, national security partner in the Clinton administration, who passed away yesterday. Well, uh, Secretary Albright was a, a dear friend. Uh, she was an incredible leader uh, and uh, advocate for uh, democracy and an adversary of fascism. And I can tell you, uh, we worked very closely together. Uh, before I ever went to the Pentagon, she was a top aide for Senator Ed Muskie. Uh, and she and I one time took a, uh, a flight out into the Atlantic Ocean to see how far out the 200 mile uh, fishing limit was going to be. And we got to that point and the pilot said, okay, we've got to turn around and go back. You've, you've been out 200 miles. And uh, so we had a good time. Normally there is a, uh, uh, some kind of a friction that exists between State Department and Defense Department. We made sure that we met uh, uh, one week at the Pentagon, another week at the State Department to have lunch together to make sure that there was no difference uh, that we couldn't resolve before taking it to the President of the United States. So we had a great relationship and that friendship extended uh, almost 50 years. And so um, it's a terrible loss for the country. Uh, she was a refugee herself. Uh, her parents uh, were on the move to escape uh, Hitler and came to this country, and uh, she rose to the highest levels, uh, first woman secretary of, of, of state, and a first uh, among many things, a, a great leader, and I'm going to miss her uh, terribly. And it seems like it's probably a good thing that we reflect on somebody who is a true American success story, the kind of thing that can only happen here. It can only happen here. You can look at uh, Madeleine Albright. You can look at, at um, Barack Obama. Uh, you can look at any of the people uh, who have come to this country or born in this country are able to uh, rise to the level of their own talents. And that's that's what makes America the, the, you know, the beacon of freedom throughout the world. People want to come here because they know given an opportunity and if they work hard, uh, they can achieve uh, uh, their dreams. Madeline was, was a great example of that. She was just an absolute uh, uh, advocate in the best sense of the word uh, to promote uh, America and our values uh, and our influence throughout the world. And she was convinced that if we try to shrink back and disengage from the world, then bad things happen. And so she was a very strong advocate for us being engaged diplomatically, economically, and yes, militarily. She was fundamental uh, to the success uh, that we uh, initiated, uh, the, the action we took in Bosnia. Uh, Madeleine Albright was out front on that issue, saying we had to do something. Uh, even though we couldn't get a, a UN Security Council resolution, she was insistent that we should never see any attempt at ethnic cleansing in our lifetime. And so uh, it's, we don't have many like her. Hopefully there are those coming up who will look to her as uh, an example of someone to follow. Shifting out of the war in Ukraine, President Biden is in Brussels today for an emergency meeting with other NATO countries. What is at stake at this meeting? The ability to hold uh, this alliance together because we haven't yet seen the depth of the economic harm uh, that will suffer as well, uh, because imposing these sanctions on uh, on the Russians doesn't just uh, affect Russia; it affects the uh, the world economy. Uh, we'll see, as we have been seeing, a spike in gas prices, uh, oil prices, uh, and um, obviously we've had some bottlenecks in terms of uh, supply chains. Uh, those will continue. So I think the the main objective uh, today uh, for uh, President Biden is to make sure we can hold the, these free nations together. You know how hard it is in this country to reach an agreement on policy. Well, here we have 30 nations who have taken the step to say uh, we are going to punish uh, Putin for his uh, invasion, uh, his destruction uh, of a free country. So we've got to do it in a way that we don't necessarily step over the line and become involved directly with the Russians. But nonetheless, holding this alliance of free nations together under these circumstances is really, uh, it's a heroic effort. I praise uh, President Biden for being able uh, to do that. And so he's there to say, can we, can we hold the line, so to speak? Because I think that Putin is betting that the West uh, will cave before he does, that he will survive the sanctions, but the West will uh, will weaken uh, because of the impact upon our own economies, uh, and in the long term, uh, will um, uh, let this uh, happen without any uh, 
serious repercussions to uh, to uh, Russia. But he's wrong on that. The Russian people are being punished for something that he himself is responsible for. And so what we have to try and do, what President Biden has to try and do is, uh, you know, fire digital bullets in that that iron wall that he has put around the, uh, the Russian people so that we can't get in to tell them what the truth is, because the overwhelming majority don't know what he is doing in Ukraine. And it's our uh, it, it's our obligation to persuade the Russian people of the truth if we can. The uh, Washington Post had an interesting report today, uh, a little bit chilling in its own way, saying that since the invasion began a month ago, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Mark Milley, have been trying to reach their counterparts in Moscow uh, to discuss what's happening about military uh, movements and so on, uh, and the, the Russians have not been responsive to this. Why is it important that we have this kind of communication between our Pentagon and Russia's military leaders? Well, we're close by. The NATO forces are in the region, so to speak. If you look at uh, the Polish, uh, uh, the, the position of our forces uh, in, in Poland, the Baltic states, uh, any time a Russian missile goes astray and possibly hits uh, one of our allies, does that mean we're involved in a Article 5 situation? So we have to be in in communication uh, with the Russians to make sure there's no miscalculation about what we are doing or what they are doing. Uh, the last thing we want to have is a head-to-head -head confrontation, which we have avoided since the end of World War II. Uh, we don't want to have uh, superpowers, certainly powers with nuclear weapons that we have, suddenly making a mistake, um, misinterpreting the actions or the statements of uh, one side to the other. That uh, is a prescription for a catastrophic disaster for the world. Put yourself back into the Pentagon for a moment. Today, what would you be most concerned about Vladimir Putin doing next? Uh, I'd be concerned, well, two things. Number one, cyber attacks, not only against Ukraine uh, and uh, the NATO allies, but well, obviously here at home, uh, that he would disrupt either our electrical grid, uh, communication system uh, that would affect travel and commerce and, uh, uh, and energy supplies. That would be a primary concern. Uh, more specifically, uh, I think we have to be concerned about his use of chemical weapons. Uh, he uh, has used them in the past. Uh, he has not ruled out using them again. And then there is the third step, of course, uh, which is using so-called tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, this is a breach of a threshold I think the world has not seen uh, since World War II. Uh, and um, that would uh, be a game changer, so to speak, in terms of what the world would do, including our, our uh, friends uh, in uh, China, India, uh, Israel, other countries that do business uh, with the Russians. What would be their reaction under these circumstances where Putin is then not only destroying uh, the Ukrainian infrastructure as such, but he's placing the world at risk. Once you think about using nuclear weapons, then you're running the risk of going up the nuclear chain, so to speak. You start with, quote, a smaller weapon with a lower yield, and then that leads to a counter strike by us or others. And then you just start climbing the ladder uh, up the, uh, the chain to uh, a, um, a global disaster. So we have to work uh, to prevent that. I, I don't know whether uh, Putin is making an idle threat, but we have to take it seriously, given his history of uh, using chemical weapons, nerve agents on his own people, uh, and those uh, in uh, Syria and elsewhere. So those are the things that we all have to be concerned about, and I'm sure that President Biden and the NATO allies are taking that up as we speak. Uh, you mentioned China, which, of course, is the other most important world player here, probably. What do you think they want their role to be? Could they step in, for example, and, and be a mediator in some way, or do they have other designs? I, I think they could. Uh, I'm hoping they can. I have made uh, this statement on multiple occasions asking uh, if the Chinese or the Indians uh, who have a relationship with Putin to be sort of uh, interventionists, whether uh, certainly it could be private uh, phone calls, meetings, whatever it takes to persuade Putin that he's pursuing a path that's going to jeopardize the world economy uh, at a minimum uh, and certainly put uh, the, uh, the security of the world at risk. So uh, I think they have this opportunity. They have taken a position. We're just neutral. We didn't start this. Russia is our friend. And they have just uh, kind of concluded a handshake uh, uh, during the Olympics to say that we're uh, together forever, unlimited uh, friendship. 
Um, so they're in a position, uh, it's difficult for them now. They have made a deal with uh, Putin, and now they're looking at what he's done. I don't think they anticipated any more than he anticipated. And so there was a great uh, cartoon in the Financial Times last week that showed uh, Putin sort of puffed up, but he had his hands were covered in blood, and he was looking to embrace uh, President Xi, and Xi was backing away. Uh, I don't know whether that reflects the reality but I'm hoping that they can use that new friendship. It's actually an older friendship, uh, but that friendship to um, make a call to the president, because I don't think there's anyone in Russia today that can go to President Putin and say, hey, boss, I think we made a mistake. Uh, we're getting uh, uh, beat on the ground uh, in Ukraine. Uh, the West is now reinforcing uh, the Ukrainians. Uh, we could lose this. I don't think there's anybody in a position uh, in the military chain of command uh, to tell Putin um, it's time to call it off. So I think it has to be his friends. And he doesn't have a wide variety of friendships. He's got the uh, the Syrians, the, the Russians, India, Eritrea, and South Korea. I mean, North Korea. And that's about it. So uh, they're the big players, and I'm hoping they can do something. Former Secretary of Defense Bill Cohen, as always, thank you for your time and insights. Always great to talk with you. Pat, great to see you and talk to you. Thank you.